Welcome to episode 349 of the Reformed Brotherhood. I'm Jesse. And I'm Tony, and we are proud members of the Society of Reformed Podcasters. Hey, brother. Hey, brother. Let's just start off the top. We've been talking about this a little bit in this summer of prayer series that we're doing. How is the two-minute prayer challenge going for you? I got to be honest. I fell off a little bit this last week. My uh, my son, AJ, your nephew, he uh, he had some rough sleep nights, and so my mornings have been all topsy-turvy. So that's the that's the beauty of habits is that they become automatic unless the context for which they are automatic gets disruptive and then right. you really have to like focus on other things. So it's a new month. I'm starting my habit trackers afresh. So hopefully uh, and he's back on a regularly sleep schedule. So hopefully, hopefully that will get back in play. I have felt I will say maybe this is actually a function of the two minute challenge. I've felt the difference. I've like felt the loss of it. Wow. Um, it, like I felt the absence of that time in that, like before when I would neglect to pray, it was just kind of like, well, that's just how it goes. Like sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. But now that I've been working on a habit, it's like, oh, I really should have, you know, not, not in like a guilty sense, but like in that same feeling, you're a runner and I'm sure you'll, you'll resonate with this. I don't know that I would call myself a runner yet, but now I'm starting to feel this same thing. Like when you're used to going out for a run in the morning and then you miss a day, it's like your legs feel that you missed a day. It's like my spirit feels that I've missed my two minutes of prayer or five minutes of prayer or whatever it is in the morning. So I think that speaks to the power of the two minute challenge. I'm with you. And of course, like we've said before, there's like no speciality with this time. It's just that this is one of the ways that God through signs has told us it's a great way to invoke and build a habit, set your timer for two minutes and just start there with a small amount of time in prayer yeah. and see where it goes. God is faithful to use these means to bring us closer to himself, but also to test our theology, to change us. And I'm with you. I've had some struggles this week, I'll be honest as well. And that's what you get on this podcast. It's just you and me talking about trying to live out this great faith that God has given to us. So we got to keep being diligent about this. I think I will say, and this is not my affirmation, but we're going to get to those in just a moment, that isn't there something beautiful in the fact that God has given us time, seasons, and then has allowed mankind to somewhat on their own, but of course, by his guidance, create like discrete intervals of yeah. time measurement. Yeah. So like when we talk about God's mercies being new every day, the fact that a month does turn over. And in some ways we sense like this refreshment, the ability to have like a clean slate or to start anew. That is a spiritual and biblical principle, which of course we impound into our calendar. So the fact that we crave that and we love that because the calendar turns over, which in some ways is really arbitrary, yeah, is still tied to this biblical principle that God makes all things new. Yeah. Yeah. You're totally right. I mean, I think there are natural rhythms to the way that the celestial bodies move. Um, that help us to understand and define these discrete increments. But I think you're right. Like the smallest, the smallest common unit of time could be two minutes, could be five minutes. Like we didn't have to pick a 60 second unit of time. We could have picked a multiple of that or a, a derivative of that. But you're right. I think it it is kind of God's grace that he has enabled us and sort of created us in a way where we think in those categories because it allows us to kind of segment out reality into like, I don't know, approachable chunks. And to be able to use that feature of reality and that feature of the way he's created us to um, improve our lives. Like I just, it, it's a, it's a, it's a thing we should be thankful for. It's a common grace that he's given all mankind. My dog doesn't think in terms of minutes and hours and seconds. It's just not how animals function. So yeah, I'm with you there. I got, that got like really philosophical. I feel like Augustine is is just right around the corner on this for some reason. Boethius, maybe. Yes, we're not far from far from Augustine and from Paul and from, by extension, Luther and Calvin. Everybody's in the mix right now. So that that's what makes this conversation is great. And of course, we're talking about this because we are, as I said, going through the Lord's Prayer this summer, taking it piece by piece, like chewing on like the fat, I guess, as it were, of like almost every word. And on this episode, we're talking about one word in particular. I mean, several that surround it, but this idea of 
hallowed or hallowed. And if you want to play a fun game, you can just count the number of ways in which we use that and say that word <laughs> differently. But of course, it is the same word. But before we get to all of that, and there's a lot of good stuff coming, I anticipate because you and I had a quick meeting where all we did was confirm that that's exactly what we're talking about. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be good. Let's do some affirming and let's do some denying. It's a crowd pleaser. It is, ex you know, eternally contemporary. Yes. So what are you affirming with on this episode? So I don't know about you. I mean, I, I know you live in an apartment complex. So you probably don't have to do this often, if ever, but... I mowed the lawn today and I'm just affirming mowing the lawn. Like there's something really satisfying about taking dominion by cutting a bunch of grass down. Like we have a riding lawn mower for the church. And so I'm doing the church lawns. So there's like something really like calming about just doing like the lawn mowing with the riding mower. But then like to look out over the lawn and it's all nice and uniform and it's clean. It looks nice. There was just something really satisfying about that. I don't know that there's any deeper theological significance or anything like that. I just, I did that today and really enjoyed it. It was, it was nice. So I'm affirming mowing the lawn. Allow me, if you will, to insert some deeper theological significance into what you just said, because I know it's there and you would agree with me on this. I think, and, and let me present to you this hypothesis. It's not just in the cutting of the grass shorter, which is pleasant to see a complete lawn at the same level, but what makes it like more satisfying to like an exponential level is when you do it with these like clean rows where you actually yes. see the blade having passed. If you were to just go and mow haphazardly, I submit it would be far less satisfying for you to look out yeah. on that lawn. Would you agree? Yes. And in fact, I face that every time I mow the lawn because I am a total amateur and the yard is not regularly shaped and there's weird hills all over the place. However, the, the inn next door has a big flat grassland or uh, like right. grass area and a professional landscaping company that does the lawn. So there's like our lawn, which is all janky and irregular. And then there's the next door lawn that looks like a soccer pitch with like nice, neat angular cuts. So th there's nothing quite like for me, the satisfaction when a new soccer game starts and you look out over the pitch and it's like that perfectly mown, pattern into the grass. I actually tried to look up a YouTube video of how to do that. And then I gave up because there's no way I could make it happen on our lawn. It's intense. Yeah. It's like a specific pattern you have to do and you have to like know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. This is why like lawn architecture or like, like is a legitimate degree. Of course, it's not just a course in like the skills of like mowing, but in how you bring about this life. And this is like, again, we can't help but become spiritual, I think. Like this taking dominion, but the dominion is in many ways like bringing order, or maybe I say it this way, restoring order. So like when you mow a lawn with like in, I would say, like cooperation or cooperation with the contours of that geography, it's just like a beautiful thing. You look out on it and you're, you see these neat rows, you see them conforming to the shape of the lawn you have, no matter how big or small. I don't think anybody can't look at that and just sit back and be satisfied. Yeah. Yeah. Where does that feeling come from? Right. Yeah. It C.S. Lewis has something to say about this. I'm sure. <laughs> when you long for a grass that is mown, not like your own, that, that points to something. Yeah. Somebody find us that quote that, that should be a bumper sticker. I think you're right about that. Yeah. What about you? What are you affirming today? So my affirmation is kind of also of this nature, like the simple pleasures, the simple things that mankind has created by the grace of God to make our lives not just easier, but like more enjoyable. Like easier is in some ways uh, a low bar. And then there's like this enjoyable sense where it's like, we don't even deserve to have this kind of joy and God gives it to us. And so this will become plain to you in just a moment, but it'll seem super nerdy to everybody else. I'm affirming with, the and you can look this up. I suggest on Amazon, for instance, Uni Kuratoga Advanced Upgrade Model 0 0.5 millimeter mechanical pencil. And the reason why, as if how, I don't even know how I would look that up. I don't even know what language you were just speaking. <laughs> so go with the Kuratoga Advanced Upgrade Model. So that's K U R U T O G A. And here's why this is like just amazing grace of God. If you've operated any mechanical pencil, you've known that, especially if you keep that point on the paper for any length of time, what you end up with is lopsidedness. You end up with like a razor sharp, like piece of lead that gets dull on one side and then sharpens on the other to like this amazing point. What this pencil does, 
and this is amazing to me, is every time you lift it up, it rotates the lead so that you never end up with a lopsided sharpening. And I was skeptical of this because, of course, in principle, by the physics of it, it seems reasonable. But how does it actually work in practice? Loved ones, it is a beautiful thing. It does take a little bit of time to get used to the fact that you can, in some ways, feel slightly that's happening. It's just remarkable. Leave it to the Japanese in particular to say, this is a problem we ought to solve and it's worth putting all of our effort into. And here's the thing. The reason for this affirmation, two parts, one amazing technology. The second, and you should be asking this, is how much does this amazing technology cost? $200? $500? Like, what do I have to pay to get a pencil that rotates the lead for me on its own, almost by its own nature, so that I always have a sharp point? Like, what kind of magic is this? It's $9.99. Oh. Less than $10. You got it cheaper than I'm finding it. So let me read this description. I'm on jetpens.com, which may be one of the coolest websites that I just discovered right now. Here's the description of this pencil. Quote, there's a real problem that affects almost all mechanical pencils. Bear with us as we explain. As you use a regular mechanical pencil, the lead wears down on one side, forming a slant wedge-shaped tip. Each time you put the lead to the page, you end up using a different lead surface depending on how you hold the pencil. This can cause dramatic and unsightly variations in the line I'm thickness sorry. as you write or draw. The Kuratoga eliminates this problem with the use of an ingenious lead rotation mechanism that continually rotates the pencil lead as you write. A spring-loaded clutch twists the lead incrementally each time you lift the pencil from the paper. This allows a uniform wearing of the lead to create a canonical tip shape that provides a fine, consistent line. So if you, dear listener of the Reformed Brotherhood, are sick of uh, unsightly variations in line thickness as you write or draw, Disgusting. then the Uni Koratoga Advanced Model me- Mechanical Pencil is for you. It's true. Uh, honestly, the Advanced comes in. You can get a plastic version. This is a metal version of it. Yeah. It's amazing. And because I'm skeptical and because I truly believe that every worldview should be able to stand up under its own weight and to be challenged critically. When I got this pencil, here's the first thing I did. I ripped off a small piece of paper, put that paper on my desk, and I took the pencil and I continued to lift it and push it down to see if the paper would rotate so that I could see it. And in fact, it did. So, and I've compared my writing like pre and post this pencil. It's, I have other pencils that I continue to use and I love. This is just like a, a different kind. So again, it's a small thing, but what a time to be alive. And yeah. what about the grace of God that occurs? And I always say this like half jokingly, right? That like, this is just an amazing thing that God has given to us that there's this incredible technology all across the world. One of that piece of technology is rotating your pencil lid so that it always stays sharp on every side. So I, I think I'm about to just blow up our whole episode here. So <laughs> I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking, it might've been Matt Walsh. I don't remember who it was. But they were talking about uh, all of these like UFO, UAP stuff that's going on and the whistleblowers. Right. And he was making the point that if another country had this kind of advanced technology, that they certainly would have taken over the earth. I agreed with him until I started reading about this pencil. And now I'm convinced that these <laughs> flying saucers or whatever they are actually just it's just the Japanese driving their, their regular vehicles to work every day because they are they are living in the future, brother. So I know that we've said we're never we were never going to take on sponsors. You're never going to hear us talking about purple mattress and getting paid for it. But right. I'll tell you what, if Uni Kuratoga, I think that's the brand name. If Uni Kuratoga wants to sponsor us, then we are all about that, I guess. There's nothing like a great writing utensil. We've said this time and time again. It moves you. It changes you. This is the grace of God. All right. That's a lot of positivity. Let's get negative. What are you denying against? So to piggyback on my mowing the grass affirmation, I'm just denying seasonal allergies. I don't know if you can hear it, but I can feel it. The snot is just draining down the back of my throat as we speak. I can feel the sore throat. It, it just It's that time of year, and, and going out mowing the lawn doesn't help that. So as great as, uh, as great as mowing the lawn is and as much of a sign of God's grace as a nicely, freshly shorn grass uh, is uh, the the seasonal allergy attack that accompanies it is not pleasant. That, that's all I got. That's the whole thing. 
No, that's fantastic. And again, that's it's almost like we planned this. It dovetails so nicely with this idea that yet while we take dominion, we do it at great cost. Yes. That, that's something like Genesis 3 action happening right now. And the great cost is, again, we've talked about this before. Allergies are a constant reminder to me how contingent we are as beings. And that these microscopic particles of dust and pollen can cause such discomfort, such because it's an emotional, not emotional. That's not the word I wanted. It is an emotional response, but an immune response as well. It's it's not just like like well, I'm just irritated. Your body's literally like, I need to fight this thing. Yeah. Why is it fighting the place and the the stuff that God has given us? It's because of sin. Yep. Yep. That's that's it. That's the whole denial. It's adventures in Genesis three. If I, I knew that, if I knew Genesis three better, I could give you the specific verse, but I don't off the top of my head. It doesn't matter. All of it is causing us to to fight, you know. But but you know, in Christ we crush that serpent's head, right? It's coming. Do. Yeah, there won't there be, be allergies there. in the new heaven and new earth. There, yeah, there will be a day, right? Like, can you imagine actually in heaven? I presume at some point in the new heaven, new earth, we're gonna have like all of this amazing foliage, like all the fauna, all of the all of it together, and. Do you think there'll be a time where we'll be like, why is it that I'm not sneezing right now? Like, I love these flowers. I love this. Just realize. Like, I'm just rolling around yeah. down hills and I'm just loving it. And there's, there's nothing out there that is making me think, where is the Zyrtec? Yeah. Yeah. Where's my, where's my uh, Benadryl? Yeah, maybe. I mean, I think, I think we're probably still like when you're going to be able to grow, mow the grass with perfect lines and uh, not sneeze. So that's, that's great. That's good stuff. And your pencil lead will always be conical. <laughs> you won't even need a mechanism to do it. It'll just, it just will be. Right. Because like, again, not to be over spiritualizing this thing, but don't we want that lead to be sharp? And how is it that like we, we suffer? I'm saying this, of course, half-heartedly, like that we suffer underneath the weight of not getting what we want there with the fact that we'd like it to be precise and on point, pun intended. And so I'm I'm looking forward to heaven. I'm like in every conceivable way. I think that God gives us these things so as to emphasize his great goodness to us and his provision for us in making this place that is a return to the garden. And the garden is perfect in every conceivable way, both at like the macro and the micro level. And I think we underemphasize like the micro level. Like yeah. God gave that as a place to Adam and Eve so that everything would be pleasant, every little thing would be pleasant, but also every big thing not just like the great needs that we have but also that we'd find joy in air all the small things so like the in, infinitesimal level and so that's why i think there's so much more than we can possibly understand and the scriptures tell us that case of course so i'm totally with you i have i have to go back to your pencil affirmation here for a second because we're talking about thorns and thistles and the reason i don't use mechanical pencils is is because of this question does the lead break frequently on this pencil I don't, it hasn't broken for me at all, but like, I am like a 0.5 guy. I know some would say they want something smaller. I think, listen, you don't need anything smaller. Who are we trying to fool? Especially here? not if you have the perfect conical tip. Exa exactly. And so that's why I know you can literally, I'll show you sometime. Like, if you look at my notebook, you can see when this pencil begins because everything is really tight and, and literally like everything is really crisp. The, <laughs> there's consistency yeah. I, you're going to get me too excited. How dare you? I'm looking forward because we're going to be at the beach next week and <laughs> there's going to be a conversation where we whip out our, our journals and show each other the handwriting yeah. stuff that we've been working on. So it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'm pretty excited. Maybe we'll live stream that. That would be everybody's. It's probably great. not going to happen. But we yeah, that was, we can enjoy. That'd be everybody's great excitement and joy. <laughs> so Jesse, before we get lost in the weeds of this mechanical pencil again, what are you denying today? So I'm denying against, uh, well, let me explain because I tried, I, I tried to figure out a way to encapsulate it real quick, but I can't without betraying like all the details. So we had a whole episode, maybe multiple episodes, but we had at least one that was dedicated exclusively to this idea of deconstructing faith. Yes. And in that episode, we use by example, just because they themselves had come out publicly and in some ways made a spectacle of it. Rhett and Link, who have their own yeah. YouTube channel called Good Mythical Morning. You can go look at that. I recently came across the fact that since they've deconstructed from their, at least what they call evangelical Christianity, by deconstruction, we're using that word like generally to mean like basically renouncing or recanting of that faith. Yeah. That I, I didn't know this, but ever since the time they did that, annually, 
they do like a, what they call a spiritual update and they take turns at this. So I saw this most recent years, three years after the fact, recent update. And I think it was Rhett who was giving the updates. And uh, I will just go with the, the headline here. He was building up in this video or in the podcast, like how dramatic what he was about to reveal was, like how this is going to be like the crescendo, this great like zenith, and that's going to be controversial and that he had gone through all this processing and now he's in year three. Here's what he said. His great reveal was that I am not a Christian, but I am a person of faith. And I literally was like, that is the worst climax I've ever heard yeah. in my entire life. Because what it betrayed to me, what he betrayed to me was that this fact that he didn't understand that we are all people of some kind of faith. Yeah. Either we put faith in ourselves to understand the world as we think it is. We put faith in somebody else. We're all people of faith. There, there's nothing dramatic about that. Like that's like saying like him getting on and being like, listen, I have this big thing this close. It's going to be controversial. I breathe air. <laughs> right? Like, and so I'm denying against what it, what it taught me in that moment is that some people think that like faith is the domain of the religious, however you define that. And that's the way he was interpreting it. And then I looked in the comments and there were all these people praising this idea of like, oh yes, I too am not a religious person, but I found myself a person of faith. And I'm thinking, you just found yourself as a person. Yeah. So it's not, and we've talked about this before, Calvin writes on this extensively. It's not the faith itself. It's the object of that faith. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right. So like I'm denying against this idea that like somehow to be elevated or to realize some kind of self-aggrandizement is to say like, I'm not religious, but I am a person of faith. And people were praising this idea as if there was some like elevated nature of consciousness that you've come to understand that you're a person of faith and that faith can be disassociated. We are all people of faith. So it's just a matter of, what is it that you're putting your faith in your own understanding or a kind of faith in the false or idolatrous things, or whether you're putting your faith in what is true about reality. That is God and his son, Jesus Christ and his Holy spirit. So I'm just not, I guess the idea that like faith is like some kind of weird domain of the religious and that somehow faith by itself on its own is some kind of elevated status that we ought to praise and worship on its own as if somebody's arrived simply because they have faith. That's like, the lowest bar. It's like yeah. the least common denominator. If you breathe air, you have faith. It's just a matter of understanding what it is that you have faith in. Yeah. And I think too, like this, this points to points to the reality that the, the unbelieving world can only borrow Christianity's capital. Like, I know that's well, like sure. a really deeply presuppositional apologetics no, that's, cut, that's but, but the idea that being a quote person of faith would somehow be like a positive beneficial thing. Yes. There's the element that like everybody has faith in something like everybody puts their trust in something. Everybody has a certain level of confidence in something. And if it's not in God, it's, it's in something else. Um, but also even the phrase like a person of faith or right. a person of, of belief. I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Like all of that language is just the unbelieving world borrowing on the positive elements of Christianity and trying to kind of co-opt it for themselves. So I'd, I'd be interested to see and hear like what, what, I don't know. And maybe I'll watch the video. Maybe I won't, but I'd be interested to understand what does he mean by that? Cause there are some people who have kind of quote unquote deconstructed and I actually, I actually don't think this is entirely a negative thing when this happens this way. And I don't know if this applies to them. There are some people who deconstruct away from a, away from a, um, a detrimental or a defective or a deformed version of Christianity, right? So you could say that a, you could, in a certain sense, say like a Roman Catholic who comes to realize that works righteousness is bankrupt and becomes a Protestant and, and has true trust and faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. That's a, that represents a certain form of deconstruction. Um, or even a, a Protestant who is in some sort of defective version of Protestantism that deconstructs away from that and still ends up with a, some sort of confidence or some sort of relationship with Jesus. I'd be interested to see, because a lot of times people say, I, when they say I'm a person of faith, what they mean is basically like that old video. I think his name was Jefferson Bethke that like, I love, yes. I, I don't, I, I love Jesus, but I hate religion. Right. There's a certain element of, um, I'm going to get like 
beat up online for this. There's a certain element of truth to that kind of experience that some people have, not because religion is bad in and of itself. Um, Christianity is a religion. It has sets of rituals and rules, and that's an element of what it means to be a Christian is to have this religious component. But what's being said in those contexts is usually um, my faith is in a person, not in a, a institution or a structure. And there's an element of truth to that. But even that statement is still borrowing from the worldview of institutional Christianity to even draw those distinctions. So yeah, we did an episode on deconstruction. We did an episode on Derek Webb. um, That basically was an episode on deconstruction in and of itself. Another word for deconstruction is usually just apostasy. Like it's usually like I have realized that Christianity is not true. And so I'm, I'm not a Christian anymore, but it'd be, It'd be interesting to see more of what they mean when they say I'm a person of faith. Because I would guess when they say I'm a person of faith, it means that they, it, it's it's a new way or a different way of saying like, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Exactly. It's the same kind of silly nonsense that um, we've been seeing for years. And it, you're right. It just, there's no, it's a totally incoherent position. Like I know people who are atheistic materialists who don't believe in a spiritual world, who don't believe in the immaterial that will stay still say on some level, I'm a spiritual person. I'm like, what does that, what does it even mean? What, what can you possibly mean when you say I'm a spiritual person, when you deny the idea that there is a spiritual reality and it, it's just a function of our society where like words don't mean anything anymore. Like they can mean whatever you want. They don't have any concrete meaning. They have no set usage. You just say words and I don't know, meaning fills in the gaps is kind of how it goes. Something you said really struck me, this idea that sometimes we'll say, well, I want to be spiritual, but I don't want to be religious. Right. As if like we're trying to contend in the spiritual realm that roles and principles don't matter, don't exist. So we would agree that in the physical space, there are these rules and they dictate how we live because there are principles under which we cannot escape. As if like that's okay in the physical space, but that in the spiritual realm, we should expect like this complete freedom, like this ephemeral nature where there wouldn't be anything that exists of like a comparable degree. And that's the problem. Actually, I would say this is not unlike what we've been talking about with like the Lord's Prayer. We've been talking about how this is like a form. It's not necessarily prescriptive with respect to the words, but if you use the words and you use them in the way that it is intended in the spirit of the way in which God gives them to us, then that is wonderful. So like we, we've been talking about this idea that this prayer, it was dictated by Christ. And for this reason, all Christians to really hold it in chief esteem as coming from him, that was the wisdom of God himself. And because of that, he knew well all of our necessities. And he also knew most perfectly what the will of God is towards us. And so it was dictated so that we might have an example or a pattern of all the prayers that we ought to use. So those that would use this and say like exclusively, well, you got to pray these things or you're not doing it right. I think we would kind of eschew that perspective and say, well, it's not exactly what was meant here. And yet if you want to use the prayer as both like a model in its kind of general sense, but if you want to use it explicitly with the words, that's fine. In so much as you understand it to be, this is the way that God has taught us we ought to think about prayer and how we ought to apply it in our own lives and even use our own words. That's also okay. So it is not that we should be bound to this like very frame of the form of words. It may also be free, freely used by us. And I think yeah. that is liberating in the way that we think about it. So we talked about these, all of these like different ways in which there is embedded in this prayer, these implications, these ways in which we're asking God to do something for us. And some have split it like evenly among six different petitions, three towards God, three towards man. And we're really finding ourselves in the place of acknowledging both that God is our father, that he is God in heaven. We spoke about that in the last two episodes. And now we're getting to this whole hallowed thing, which we do have to admit is at least in English, kind of an old fashioned word. Yeah. Um, There's a lot there that we can unpack and perhaps that we will, but let's start with acknowledging that I'm guessing like you and I don't use the word hallowed a lot like in our normal vernacular. Yeah, it's funny because I I just want to say thank you to the hosts of Jeopardy for providing me with a perfect intro to this podcast episode. Oh, really? I don't know if you've heard about this yet, but recently on, on an episode of Jeopardy, 
and your wife pointed this out to me and specifically said, I know you guys are doing a series on the Lord's Prayer. You should make sure to talk about this. So thank you, uh, Ashley. Uh, recently on Jeopardy, there was a question, and the question read, this was a $200 question. So for those of you who are not familiar with Jeopardy, this was not intended to be a difficult question. The people who put it together thought this was going to be like a gimme. The puzzle read, Matthew 6, 9 says, Our Father, which art in heaven, this be thy name, right? And so this, you're supposed to fill in the blank. Right. And not only did they not get it, nobody even tried to guess. Oh, really? So, so the Lord's Prayer... It used to be that like this is like just people just know it. Whether you actually were a right. believer or not, right. there were just some things that you knew. You knew the Lord's Prayer. And at the very least, you would know this phrase because this is one of the most, I mean, this is like one of the more famous parts of the prayer. And nobody even got it. So this understanding of what it means for the Lord's name to be hallowed or to be made holy, if we want to use more like current language, is something that is not only needed in the church, but I think actually we need to be able to articulate it and talk about it and describe it in the broader culture. There's an apologetics, um, an apologetic value to being able to articulate what it means for God's name to be holy or to be made holy. And that's actually the nature of this petition, right? So right. when we say hallowed be thy name, because it's in this sort of archaic form, um, we don't recognize that it actually is a petition. We're not making a statement. So our Father, which art in heaven, that's a statement. It's an address. Right. Our Father is a noun, and which art in heaven is a description of that noun. When we say, hallowed be thy name, we're not just saying your name is holy. We're petitioning God to make his name holy, to, right to bring holiness and and we should be careful because we're not wanting him to change something. We're wanting him to manifest or to reveal something. And first and foremost, we're asking him to reveal that to us, but we're asking him to make his name holy among the nations, among the people. So the fact that like even, even the eggheads on Jeopardy couldn't remember one of the most common phrases in the English language, they didn't even, they didn't even try to guess it. That says something about the state and the holiness of God's name among the nations and among the people. So I think this is really timely. And I think as we dig into it, this actually is, I think, maybe the petition that is kind of the most important petition for us in our day and age. Because I, maybe I'm maybe I'm speaking out of turn. Maybe I'm revealing my age. You and I are pretty close in age, so I think you're going to resonate with this. There are probably some younger listeners of our podcast, I feel like I'm just like the oldest man. There are probably some younger listeners of, there probably are some uh, of our listeners who are on the younger side who won't remember a time like this in their life. But when I was in like middle school and high school, everybody went to church. Everybody was a part of a youth group. Everybody had Wednesday night religious activities. We didn't, teachers didn't assign homework on Wednesdays because they knew people were going to catechism class and to confirmation. It's not like that now. People don't know basic facts about Christian religion anymore. And God's name, although we, can, we can't say that it was ever holy among the nations in the truest sense, it did carry a certain special place of fear and reverence and respect and regard that it just doesn't anymore. So for our day and age, I think probably this is like the petition we really need to lean into the most when we're praying, is that God would restore to our nation in America, but the, really the whole world, would restore to the world a knowledge of his name and a, a regard for his name. Now, obviously, we're not talking about like, it would be great if there was this widespread mass conversion and repentance. That would be awesome. Pray for that. But what I'm talking about is just a regard for his name. It used to be that people wouldn't use the Lord's name in vain, even if they weren't Christians. It was still had this like weight to it. And that's just not the case anymore. So I think that this is a, a really timely episode, and I'm really, really excited to sort of dig into what this means. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's you're right on, of course. Like, it's one of those things in which we've underemphasized what this prayer says to us, like the direction it gives us, the prescription that it's trying to impart upon us. And I think, like, it's if helpful, like, in defense of language, at least like the English language, here's why, at least in my estimation, why you're still seeing this word hallowed or hallowed in your Bible is because it's not sufficient just say holy, 
So like this idea of like hallowed is consecrated. It is, of yeah. course, nothing less than holy, but it's also sacred, revered, like acclaimed, lifted up, praised of like the highest degree or order. And so I would say that most people know this word, at least in the, in the English speaking word, uh, because they know Halloween, which is like the yeah. same root of this word. So hallowed is the past participle, the word hallow. It's a term that descends from the Middle English Halloween. And that word can be traced back to the Old English adjective halig, meaning holy. So like during the Middle Ages, All Hallows Day was the name for Christians, what Christians now call like All Saints Day. Either way, it was this idea that there's something set apart, like otherworldly about this. And I, I like what you're saying, because what gets sometimes confused is that like the very first thing that Jesus tells us to ask God to do, like the very first thing. It's ahead on the list. It's above all the others. If like you're making a shopping list, here's where it appears at the top is this idea of like Hollywood. It's the marching orders. It's all this encompassing data. The first thing God or Jesus tells us to do is to ask God to do that which God would cause his name to be hallowed, made yeah. holy. So the first and the all pervasive, all influencing, all controlling concern in prayer is to plead that God would make his name supremely valuable in the minds and the hearts of people. So like I was always thinking about the episode we're going to do, my like sneaky premise was going to be, it means everything it says and more than we even think. Yeah. Because when we say that we would ask that God's name would be supremely valuable in the minds and hearts of people is salvific, isn't it? Yeah. It's this idea that like what we're asking for is God to bring a salvation to all peoples at all times through his name. And by using his name, what we're invoking is every character trait of God, all the simplicity of God would be poured out in pragmatic fashion on the entire world such that because of the Holy Spirit, they would look to God and say, yes, you are worthy to be praised. You are holy and above. You're unchartered. You're on the margins. We can't find the edges of you. And because of that, we fall on our knees and we say, you are worthy. Yeah. And so all of that is encapsulated in just like a couple of words. But instead, I think we kind of say like, well, what we're implying here is like, we want to respect God. Like he's got a title, like he's the president yeah. or he's the CEO. And so like that office desires and requires some kind of respect, but it's more than that, that we're asking for the salvation of the entire world by saying, God, because you're in sovereign and control of all things. And because we only know that those who acknowledge your name are those whom you've changed and regenerated, this is a plea for salvation, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important for us grammatically to remember what this word is doing, right? Because like I said earlier, when we hear the phrase hallowed be the be your name or be thy name if we want to go King James style, we have this tendency to think that this is like a declarative statement that we're, we're right. making a statement about the nature of God's name. But that's not grammatically that's not what's going on. Right? So so grammatically this is an aorist imperative. So it's a it's it's a command form of a verb. And when we address somebody for a command in this way, it's, it's like a request. Um, so we're, we're asking God and in a, in a sense, grammatically, we're commanding God to make his name holy. And I know that sounds blasphemous, but there is, there is precedent in the Bible for God's people to make demands of God when it's related to his covenant or when it's related right. to a promise that he's made. And, and when it's related to something that God actually wants to do, that God, God has commanded us to demand of him, right? Like when, when, um, in the Psalms, when, when the, um, psalmist says, remember your people, O Lord, or something like that. It's the same thing is going on here. It's not just a request. It's actually stronger than a request. We're not saying, God, pretty please make your name holy or, or give your name reverence among the nations. We're right. demanding of God in a proper register, a proper right. holy register. We're demanding that God hallows his name, that he Do makes it great among the nations. Uh, and when I say among the nations, I'm just using that because that's that's the biblical language we get from places like the Psalms and from the prophets. We're we're seeking out God's um, we're seeking out that God would would give His name the renown and the sense of uh, not separateness, 
let me just read a quote that I found as I was doing a little a little bit of quick research here beforehand. Because there's a book um, that I didn't realize I had in my Logos library, but when I was looking for Holiness of God by R.C. Sproul, which I don't have in my library, I actually found this book. It's okay. called Holy, 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 Proclaiming the Perfections of God. And it's like a multi-author edited one by a bunch of Ligonier people. And the chapter two is on Hallowed Be Thy Name. It's a book on holiness here. And this is what uh, Sinclair Ferguson, who wrote the chapter, says. He says, in in the Father, he kind of takes this take that, which is different than what we said, but it's not super relevant. He takes this take that this is really specifically about the first person, the Trinity, and then he extends that to the second and third person. But he says here, in the Father, and so we could say in the Father, and by extension, the Son and the Spirit, Holiness is a purity of an infinite intensity and beauty that creates a sense of awe and wonder in the spectator. So when we when we um, petition God, when we seek God to hollow his name, what we're saying is to make known to all people, especially yes. to Christians, but to, to people who are not yet Christians and and to those who never will become Christians. Right. It's it's it's. Um, as Paul says, it's life to those who are being saved and, and an aroma of death to those who are perishing. Right? This, it's that same dynamic here. God making his name holy to Christians is revealing to them a holiness that is a, quote, purity of an infinite intensity and beauty. I don't know how much more like wordsmithy you can get than that. I mean, this is Sinclair Ferguson and he's, he writes, he's written three books since we started this episode, <laughs> but that's what it is. But at the same time, we're also kind of praying that that would be judgment to those who reject God because they're being presented with this infinitely beautiful, pleasing, perfect God. And they're saying, I don't want anything to do with that. So there really is a lot to this that I think is, is going to be fun to unpack a little bit more as we keep going here. Yeah. It's a bit like saying like, listen, the name of God representing all his character is a knife. And so if you want a salad, you need this knife because it cuts all your vegetables, it cuts the cucumber and who doesn't love a little bit of cucumber in their salad. But if your finger is in the way yeah. it will cut your finger yeah there's just no doubt about it so it is both like a blessing and potentially a curse but it comes with like the full rate of reality that is a sharp blade cuts so if we are saved in that we have been removed from the path of the blade then it brings us great joy yeah. if we find that we have not been removed from the blade then it's going to cut us and so it means that we are praying that his name be set apart in people's hearts and minds and lives as the infinitely great and beautiful and valuable reality that it is. Yeah. And so that's where we find, I think in this, I, I often struggle with the Lord's prayer at times because it seems like it lacks this kind of like demonstrative missional purpose, but this is where we find the missional purpose that God's name be high and lifted up. How is God's name high and lifted up? It is only when people have been saved into the family of God, such that they recognize the name of the father. And so by virtue of that, then they worship it. And so like the first and overarching thing that we're told by Jesus to ask God is to do that God would exercise his jealousy for his name, that God would display the greatness of himself, that God would make much of himself, that God would overcome blindness and seeing himself, that God would overcome indifference to himself, that God would remove obstacles to knowing and admiring and loving and trusting and treasuring and obeying God. And like you said, that is certainly, and maybe perhaps for, first and foremost, for his own people. It's also for all the peoples. Yeah. So we've talked about, that, like, for instance, the sacrifice of Christ unapologetically being sufficient for all, but efficient for the elect. It does cover in its sufficiency all people. We're asking that God would draw onto himself all of those whom he's called onto himself. And it happens in the Lord's Prayer. It's not like it's absent. So that's really, to me, like, this is the heart of what it means to be born again. Before we are born again, human beings are central in our own mind, our own affections. God is not. The passion of God for the supremacy of God makes no sense and is totally offensive to everybody who has not been regenerated by God. Yeah. yeah. But when we're born again, it literally changes. We've talked about this, like, productivity. It changes our mental framework. Yeah. It's renewed. That's like Roman style. And we come to desire the image of Christ in our own selves. And when we do that, we're saying, hallowed be the name of God. So there's so much in this for me that is like missional. It's lovely. And the petition, I think, is like sequential and inconsequential yeah. or 
you know, like you can't, you have to start here because if you don't start here, you're going to see that like every subsequent petition is like cheap. Yeah. It's not worthwhile. It falls short. And so the first thing that we ought to do is to ask that God would make his name, which again, like that's God's like shorthand for all of who I am. Yeah. Everything I've done, all that I am represented in all the world, the exact reality that I've created and explained to humankind. That's what he means by his name. And so he's saying, would you ask that that would be great? Would that be like the desire of your heart? Which in itself is like to pray that thing Yeah, is a change. So like, this is like, I think of all that we talked about so far, and we talked about heavy things, this to me like settles so thick, like so heavy on our shoulders. And it's almost like to me, to forgive the expression, like God is like sneaking it into this prayer. Yeah. You know, like we're almost saying like, yeah, we recognize God, you're great. And we'd like to make sure that like you're properly respected and like whatever title title that you have, like Mr. God, we refer to you that way. Yeah. It's not that. Right. It's that God would come and change all of the world so that they would see him as high and lifted up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we, we, this is unabashedly the reformed brotherhood, not the Lutheran brotherhood. We love Chad Bird, but this isn't the Lutheran brotherhood. This isn't the general evangelical brother. This is a reformed brotherhood. And so one of the things that I, I have always, um, valued about the Reformed tradition, even before I understood that I was within the Reformed tradition, is a sober recognition of our limitations and our inability. Yes. And so the 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 beginning of the Lord's period, the first petition, not only do all the other petitions sort of ring hollow and short if God is not who he says he is, right? We talked about that a little bit last week, that the only reason we can pray to this God is because he's the God who's in heaven as opposed to the God who's constrained to earth or something like that. Right. This petition takes that and sort of ratchets it up another notch. Just like yes. the third commandment, blaspheming the name of the Lord would also include blaspheming his works, blaspheming anything he's revealed himself by. The same thing is true here. And where this ties into the Reformed tradition of recognizing our own limitations, and I should be straightforward, the Lutheran tradition holds just as robust of a doctrine of total depravity. I don't think as consistently, but they, they would affirm total depravity almost exactly the way we do. But all of that said, let me just read from the Westminster Larger Catechism rather than trying to like repackage it myself and screwing it all up. It says here, what do we pray for in the first petition? And the answer is, in the first petition, which is hallowed be thy name, acknowledging the utter inability and indisposition that is in ourselves and all men to honor God aright, we pray that God would, by his grace, enable and incline us and others to know, to acknowledge, and to highly and highly to esteem him and his titles, attributes, ordinances, words, works, whatever else he is pleased to make himself known. One of the things that I think is really, really interesting and would be really cool for someone to do a more deep dive on the language that is used in the portion of the catechism that talks about the Lord's prayer here reflects so much of the language that's used in the same catechism in reference to the 10 commandments. So in a certain, yes. in a certain way, like you? the 10 commandments, <laughs> I just stole all of Jesse's thunder. Apparently <laughs> the, the, the confessions use the 10 commandments as like this rubric for, for the moral framework that we are all to live in. Yes. And then immediately following that, they switch over to the Lord's prayer. And now it's like, God help us. Like, here's the here's yes. the, the righteous, perfect requirement of the law, and we cannot do it. So Lord, this prayer has been given to us to seek to get your aid and your empowering to accomplish that. So just in this first petition, if you're using that, right, it's got uh, the enable us to know, acknowledge, and highly esteem him. Well, that's the first, that's the first and second commandments. Like when you read the right. confessional language about the second commandment, the first commandment, it's about knowing and acknowledging, receiving the Lord's appointed, like the, the worship that God has appointed, the ordinance that he's appointed, then to highly esteem of his titles, attributes, ordinances, word, works, and whatever else he's pleased to make us known. That's straight out of the language of the third commandment. And right. as you go through the rest of this, it doesn't line up exactly, but each of these petitions drives us to a an element of worshiping God rightly, and that is to seek his assistance and his, and when I say assistance, I'm saying that like an anthropomorphic mission. It's not as though God is just like helping us do this. He's, he's sanctifying us, enabling us. He's making it possible. But to seek the Lord and to ask that his name be hallowed is also, this, this just came to me. When we talked about the third commandment, 
we talked about how first and foremost, the Christian dishonors the Lord's name by living a life that's unworthy of Christ's name because it's literally applied to us. When we seek the Lord to hollow his name, of course, the first primary thing we're asking him is about his name being made known, but we're also asking him to hollow us as bearers of his name. Yes. to make us into the holy name bearers and image bearers that he deserves. So it really is this, this all-inclusive opening to prayer. It's, Lord, make your name known and great and magnified. We are unable to do that because we're fallen creatures. We're not disposed to do or think or be the right things. So not only do you have to make your name known, but you got to change us too. If we're going to have right. a hope of serving you in any way that is even close to what you'd like us to do, you're going to have to do it for us. All of that is baked into this petition. And I think it's really beautiful. This is not something that the average, and this is not a slam on evangelicals. I, like I said, I'm, I'm just coming to some of these conclusions like live in the air, just reading the catechism with you. These are not conclusions that the average Christian would come to apart from the deep reflection of exactly. the Christian tradition. And I haven't read what Luther has to say on this. I can't imagine it would be all that different, to be honest with you. I can't, I haven't read what Augustine and the patristics say on the Lord's prayer. I can't imagine that they would reflect all that differently on this petition, but the, the standard traditions of the church, the documented confessional traditions of the church are so helpful for us because it's people who've worked through all this stuff before, and we're not going to come to these conclusions on our own probably. So I'm, I'm just kind of like, I don't know, I'm all ramped up now. You got to stop me. Or I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> Again, I think like the hashtag or a podcast is like I can run through a wall because of my God. I I totally agree with you. And this is exactly what I'm saying. This idea that to pray this prayer in this way is to ask that God would do a miracle in our hearts, in our actions, and in our world, that his name would be set apart. It makes plain to God our chief desire to praise him and to want all peoples to praise him. It's to want the whole world to see him for who he really is. But how does the whole world see him for who he really is? As if the whole world was in some way regenerate, was made clean, was purified, was given like this clear and cogent view of who God is. That's what exactly is like, impound it's not even impounded, it's not hidden. This is exactly what God is saying, yeah. or Jesus is saying when he says pray this way. It's really a certainty that whatever it is, our ultimate goal is the primary objective of our, pur of our pursuit. And that the Lord Jesus in this very first petition establishes the glorification of God's name as the goal as to why we are desired the other petition, petitions. So like everything else after this point is because we're saying, God, do your thing, do your jam, make the world subject to who you are and make the world understand and see clearly exactly who you are. So is the desire for and the seeking after our deliverance and salvation, that is like conversion, faith, holiness, without being motivated to that and purely and alone by the love for yeah. and having as objective the glorification of God's name, not sinful self-love, and therefore must be neglected until we have received a love for the glorification of God. I mean, that's like the question that's before us. And I realize that was like a really convoluted question I was trying to ask. But, you know, what we're trying to get at here, I think, is that it's, again, more than just like a mutual respect or coming to this place of understanding like the identity of God himself, or even yeah. all the theology behind God himself. But what we're asking for is that God would come and save us, redeem us, continue to redeem us, and make us clear in the conception that we'd see the world not as it appears to be, but as it truly is, and that that reality can only come by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we desire that to be for all people, for all kind, for all nations, for all tongues. So we're kind of pulling in like revelation, into this prayer, but it is like clearly and purposefully missional. It is clearly and purposefully like condemning to ourselves who find God in his holiness to be a threat to who we are because we want to be in charge. We want to think of the world as revolving around us. We want all the people to pay attention to our preferences and feelings and beliefs and ideas. What we're saying is we're forsaking that. We're shooing it. We're saying it aside. We're dying to ourselves and saying, God, come and have your way. Yeah. You get priority. And so because of that, we're saying hallowed be your name. Yeah. And there's a lot of overlap um, that we're going to find between this, this petition and the next petition. 
right. in some ways they are covering a lot of the same ground. This first one is more about God revealing himself and making himself known. The second one is is more about the way that he actually does that in the world. So I think we can probably put a pin in that for this week because we don't want to steal too much thunder from next week. Um, but before we go, Jesse, I do just want to say we have a ton of people that help makes this show possible. That's true. And I really just wanted to say that I appreciate that because, you know, it's the time of year um, where we have – bills that are coming up. Um, every podcast has overhead costs. And for some reason, and this is just the way I think it works for most things, a lot of our annual bills all come up at the same time at this time of the summer. And so I'm especially reminded of in this time of year, how awesome it is that we have people who help us to, to make sure that this show keeps going. So if you are a Patreon supporter, thank you. Thank you so much for being generous and for being willing to sacrifice some of your own hard-earned money uh, to help us make sure that this show exists. And if you're not a Patreon surpri- subscriber, surpriser, a Patreon surpriser, I think everybody who subscribes to us is a Patreon surpriser in my mind. But if you're not a Patreon uh, supporter, then uh, consider it because we are committed to making sure that this show is available to people. We don't want to put anything behind a paywall. We don't want to make it uh, make it so you have to listen to us do advertisements about Purple Mattress or even the Kura Toga, whatever it is, Mechanical Pencil. Um, <laughs> and the only way we can do that is is because people support us and, and help us out. So thank you so much to those who are, are part of the Brotherhood in that way. And uh, consider being a supporter if you haven't. Yeah, you're right on. I, I appreciate that. We have a lovely family. There's lots of ways if you want to just connect. So one of those ways is by giving, which Tony already enumerated. Another way is by just maybe finding that there are other brothers and sisters that are listening and maybe you want to join in about this particular topic or others. And another way to use the internet to do that is to go to t.me backslash reform brotherhood. What you'll find with that link is it'll bring you to what's called a telegram app. That's just a way people have to connect. And that's a group chat for other listeners. And there's lots of great conversations that are happening there literally every day, which is wild. And there's all kinds of things to talk about. There's prayer requests being brought forward for people to support. And it's just a reminder that it's a lovely time that God has given us to connect with brothers and sisters all over the world who are saying, listen, let's take the summer to focus on the Lord's prayer. Let's take the two minute challenge, uh, hashtag like TM, to like make that a thing that you're going to participate in. You're doing that together with us, but also with others uh, joining in on this conversation. So I echo that. We're so thankful for those that make sure, and this is now the way I'm thinking about it. It is the Jericho model. It is tear down the walls, tear down the paywalls to make sure that (laughs) this is always free to everybody because freely you have received. And so therefore freely you shall give. And you and I take that to heart. That's the model. But the fact that like Tony's voice in your ear hole right now sounds like so mellifluous, so rich and deep and lovely. (laughs) It doesn't happen by accident. It takes technology, their costs to uploading and to hosting. It's surprising how all of these things, which seem easy to you because you just go to your podcast, podcast, podcast catcher app, and download everything. And it sounds fantastic. That doesn't happen by accident. So we are thankful for those that give and for everybody else that joins in. So I would just encourage you, like maybe you're a person that's listened to us for a long time and you thought that's somebody else's conversation. It can be yours. Yeah. Would you just kind of jump in and let us know that you're out there? Because it's not just about saying like, listen, I hear and I'm listening, but also there are lovely brothers and sisters that want to connect with you. Not, they're not going to connect with us, but want to connect with you. Yeah. And you can do that by going to something like t.me backslash reform brotherhood and saying, yo, I'm here and I love Jesus. Yeah. And let's do this together. Yeah. And you know, I'll say this uh, before we wrap up. I have not encountered a non in-person group of Christian brothers and sisters that are as committed to encouraging and praying for each other and following up with each other and being there for each other in the in a limited way, right? These are people that are in other parts of the country. There's a limited amount of being there that they can be. But I've never encountered a group of Christians outside of my local church that are as committed 
to being there for each other as this group of people that are in this telegram chat. And that's not, that's not me. And it's not Jesse that have fostered that. That is the Holy spirit bringing together people, um, under a common, uh, common gospel. Uh, right. It's not, it's not just that they're coming together under the, this, the name of this podcast. Like this is just a podcast. It's because they're coming together under the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ bound in the unity of fellowship of the Holy spirit. And they really do pray for each other. We really do seek the benefit of each other. So if you're not a part of it, check it out. T.me slash reform brotherhood. Um, you can just check it out without actually joining. You can just see what's going on in there before you join. But I think that you'll find it's a, it's a pretty great place to be online. Yeah. It's one of those like non-committal opportunities, right? You can go to the link that we just said, and you can literally drive by where their headlights off. If you want to be that person and just see what kind of conversation is unfolding. I think you'll find that it's far more authentic, far more lovely, and far more Christ-centered than maybe other corners of the internet. So, I mean, Tony, I, I love talking about the Lord's Prayer, and I want to challenge everybody to continue to set the timers this week, and every day spend at least two minutes as your schedule allows. And actually, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't allow it, that's the whole point of this, right, is to build a new habit. Yeah. We want to be closer to our Lord Jesus Christ and to his Father. And so we know, all of us know in our minds, that prayer is the conduit by which God transforms us, changes us, and in some ways proves our theology. Yeah. And so if we're excited about learning, we ought to be excited about prayer. So until we do this again, and you and I are going to do this again, next time we'll be in person together. We will. Pretty stoked. Yeah, it'll be great. So if you hear like a different excitement, this different like spring in our step, so to speak. It's because I'll be looking Tony face to face, probably sitting on like the same side of the table. With cheek to him. cheek. <laughs> cheek to cheek. Until that time comes, let's honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. This world I wouldn't